in the world of neuroscience, the phrase decision making is often used as this innuendo for the phrase free will, which is often viewed as taboo along with the word consciousness. Decision making is defined as the process of collecting pertinent information, identifying alternatives, estimating the consequences, weighing the evidence, making choices, and then taking actions. Exactly the definition of free will by Thomas Aquinas. So I want to move past the innuendo and tackle the problem of free will with you head on. Do we have free will? Do we have agency? Or is everything deterministic? If you want, you can have free will and you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can be happy with it. But how do I find it? So let's suppose that I submit a, a, uh, a proposal to NIH, the National Institute of, of Mental Health, mm -hmm. say, I'd like to study free will in rodents. Chances are high that I will not get it. <laughs> <laughs> but if I reformulate my proposal for the same proposal, but it, the title will be decision making, then nobody will blink because recently they renamed the learning and memory section, the learning and memory sections into learning memory and decision making. So to my astonishment, this so philosophically charged concept has become a central part of current neuroscience. And many laboratories are researching for decision making. And when you talk to each other, when they talk to each other, they are talking orthogonally, as far as I can see. No, you can, you can make a definition and they said, oh, this is the definition. But I can challenge any of those definitions. And you know, it, it, the, the free will sounds like I accumulated the evidence whether I should come and talk to you. And I made a decision. In reality, I made it part of the decision 20 years ago <laughs> or five years ago or two years ago, because just the fact that, uh, let's say, I assume you are talking, you will be asking questions, not about neuroscience, but about society and large and large probably that's part of my decision why to, to come here. So how do you factor in all these things and how I evaluate the accumulation of evidence against another uh, approach that the, the, the evidence is already there at birth. The evidence is there when I went to elementary school. I, when I had my religious education or when I had my other type of education or when I went to the army and I uh, looked at the world very differently through the army or, and so on and so on. And so there's a whole background of things that are leading to what you call decision-making and studying this is not a simple thing. Uh, and it's pretty spooky. Why is it spooky? So let's go, let's go back to fun history again, back to the, person who invented the machina speculatrix, Gray Walter. He did the following experiment. Uh, if you put an electrode on the, on your scalp, you can record what the Germans called Bereitschaft potential. You can call it the readiness potential. Before I move my finger, you can read out that I'm going to do something several hundred milliseconds, sometimes up to a second earlier. Mm -hmm. So the experiment that he did was, was back then, you know, you had the slide projector. If you remember that you press a bar and the slide moves. So the subjects were pressing the bar, pressing the bar, and, and then the, the slides moved and everybody knows that I did it. Now you can record for the this readiness potential. And because it happens earlier than your muscular action, it can move the slide for you. And people got scared because they lost their agency. In fact, it's a famous case that the woman sued <laughs> Gray Walter that they implanted <laughs> a machine in, in, in his brain. Now that can be reproduced easily tomorrow when you are typing on your keyboard and your word processor does, doesn't behave well, then there is a delay between your action and what's going on the screen. It's so inconvenient and, 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 and horrible to think to do it. Then you reboot the whole computer, but if there would be a second delay or long delay systematically all the time, you would learn it in two, three days. Now, the trick is now without your knowledge, I revert everything back to normal and the delay is gone. And you feel that before you actually press something, 
stuff moved already around you. That's scary. Yeah. And, and that's exactly when, where you said, okay, do this experiment, try to find a neurophysiological basis of this, and then we can talk about free will. So the readiness potential, where does that originate from? The hippocampus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. So there were, you can record typically here from the midline and people thought the prefrontal cortex is a thing, but the epileptic patients who underwent surgery and they removed their hippocampi, interestingly, they don't have it. Or oh, it's much reduced if you remove the hippocampus. Also, as a, an old experiment in, in, in the primates, that a very simple tapping experiments, you can record not this slow activity, a different type of activity is called neuronal firing, two, three, four, hundred, five hundred milliseconds earlier from the hippocampus. Yeah. Uh, so, it, <laughs> of course, I'm a hippocampus chauvinist, <laughs> <laughs> but I put my money there because it's earlier than in the prefrontal cortex. So that's still generated within me. So we are eliminating the idea of a simulation of a God. It's not possible that we have been directed. It's all happening within my brain. Everything happens in your brain. You take away the brain and the body is, has uh, left without a CEO. 